uh, apologize for the wait. I call this meeting to order. Uh, I would like to make a motion to, uh, first of all, uh, call, ro call, call to order. And we have two members here today. Um, I would like to um, go ahead and start with public comments. There are two stacks of public comments. The way I'm going to call public comments is the general public comments will be called right now. And then there are some that have filled out a card for specific items. And I will call you during that time. So I don't want, to th I don't want you to think that I left you out and that I'm not showing love because I love everybody. So we'll just put you at the right place. So the first speaker that we're going to have is um, Mr. Ed Marash, Marashi and uh, Mr. Eric Mole, you're on deck. Good evening, everybody. Um, okay, picture this. It's late at night. You're sitting at home. You're a female who's by yourself that night, and all of a sudden you hear bang, bang, back in the creek because you live along the creek. Then flash forward to the next day. You're sitting there at work, and all of a sudden you catch word there's a fire in your creek behind your house. This isn't law or order or anything else. This is actually what's going on at the junction of Floral Park and Jack Fisher Park. We've had four fires in the past two days. Now that's, I was here time before last, and again, I talked about two fires at that time. So again, it's almost like we're at strike two. We gotta really bear down and do something. What I'd like to see the city do is come up with a plan and then pull together the neighborhood associations that are affected discuss it with them, and come up with a solution that everybody can work with. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and thank you very much for your comments and coming out and making us aware of that. Uh, Mr. Eric Mull, uh, followed by Ms. Laura Perez. Hello again. Uh, I think I spoke at the last meeting, and uh, there was a recent fire behind my house, and uh, last night at 12 o'clock I woke up to another fire directly behind my house, uh, within 10 feet of the first fire. Um, I asked you guys, you know, please help us with Creek Bed. There's a lot of people walking through there. They're walking back and forth between Fisher Park and uh, the Broad Street Bridge. And if there's any way we can fence off that park so that people cannot come into the park from the Creek Bed and cannot enter the Creek Bed from the park, I think it will drastically solve some of our problems. And then on the other end, when we get to uh, the Broad Street Bridge, I know you guys were talking about fencing that off, but you didn't want to create a dead end situation. Um, I've walked through there. If we put fences on both sides and it says trail ends, why can't you just put a fence where it says trail ends? Um, and during the dry season, I don't know if it's possible to fence off the actual creek and then open that up during the rainy season. But the dry season is what we're worried about here. It's, it's, it's a tinderbox back there. There's a lot of vegetation. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really afraid. Uh, waking up in the middle of the night, every, every noise I hear back there, uh, whether it's fireworks, gunshots, apparently happened last night. I, w I was actually asleep. I woke up my wife. Um, and after the fire department left last night, and there was two fires, 10 houses apart in the same creek at the same time. Um, after the, after the uh, fire department left last night. My wife said that she's not sure she can raise children here and that we may need to move. Please, please help us out with this creek bed. It should not be that hard to, we, we fenced off the, the area at Anaheim Stadium to prevent people from camping there. We can fence off this creek bed to prevent people from going in there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Laura Perez, followed by Mr. Chris Smith. Good evening. Um, this wasn't a planned uh, visit today, but I just wanted to, um, <coughs> also bring my concerns to the table that I brought up three weeks ago at City Council regarding the prostitution problem that we have. Um, just like the previous speaker, I want, to, I want to raise my children in my city. And it's hard to not 
get this way because I feel helpless. I know we started going to that meeting two weeks, three weeks ago. Um, um, some of council members' um, assistants reached out to me to finally get a meeting started and get this issue fixed. Um, I feel a little helpless because we depend on the police officers to come out and assist us when we're getting harassed. I just got harassed this, this past weekend that my, that my stomach would get slashed. Meanwhile, a police officer that was flagged down drove away only to, be, only to come back after one of my neighbors called 911. And they came back and they left again. I have it on video. It's, it's disturbing because those were exactly the words that came out of their mouths. And I do want to thank Mr. Villegas, who will be meeting with me tomorrow as an initial meeting, and then the follow-up meeting with everyone else on the 24th. I'm hoping that Mr. Tina Harrow would, will be there since I know it's not in your ward, but it does affect the association that you represent. I feel like we're one of the associations that's most represented. I have three council members, and only Mr. Villegas has attempted to at least have a one-to-one -one before everyone else is able to join the table. Um, you know, I, I, I don't mean to get emotional, but it is an, it's very distressful. It's stressful for me. It's stressful for the children getting STDs over the years. And we shouldn't be out there fighting, literally fighting for our lives and making sure that we're not, in, we're not inside before it's 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night. And the children don't deserve to be seeing these girls when they're going to school at 8 in the morning. Nor does my 62-year-old father, who still is still working and is about to retire, he shouldn't be seeing this at 5.30 in the morning. Um, I'm hoping that everyone else that can go can assist us and that we're able to get police officers that actually listen to us, like the ones we had at 4th of July that stepped in and assisted us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perez. Uh, Ms. Chris Schmidt, followed by, uh, I believe it's Julie Mathaway. Wow. Um, after the two previous speakers, I feel like my items are very um, insignificant. Um, <laughs> A uh, tough act to follow. Um, real quick, a couple of items. Uh, I'm Chris Schmidt. I'm from the Windsor Village Neighborhood Association. This is the Public Safety Code Enforcement Neighborhood Empowerment Meeting. I've attended a lot of them. We seem to focus on the public safety side, which I can appreciate, but we don't get a lot of the neighborhood empowerment. I don't think I've ever seen Scott or Margarita from the Neighborhood Initiatives Program here make a presentation. I know Mr. Mendoza's here. I believe they work for him. Maybe we can get them to talk about what they do for our, to help improve our neighborhoods. Uh, Public Works, Mr. Fawad, you're currently slurring Fairview Street. For two years, I've asked for the intersection at Fairview and Dahl to be painted keep clear. 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning, packed up. I can't get out of my neighborhood. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., we can't. If maybe you could look into it, they're currently slurring it. I think it's American Asphalt. They're about to paint the uh, strip, striping of the lanes. Lastly, parking. We all know that parking is a big issue. In a three-week period in my neighborhood, we had 12 vehicles, nine impounded, three ticketed. In order to impound a vehicle, the registration has to be over six months old. Somebody in my neighborhood is selling cars. I want to thank Corporal Esparza for helping us out and getting that taken care of. But in three weeks, we had nine cars impounded. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Ms. Julie, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is it Matheny or Mathway? Um, my name is Julia Motherway, and Ma apparently my writing is terrible. But no, no. <laughs> I, yeah. You're fine. I, I apologize. Great. No, thank you very much. I appreciate the time here. I'd like to start by thanking Santa Ana Police Department, who's been out at my house several times in the past couple of years. They've been very prompt and have made me feel safe. What I don't feel safe about is a couple of situations. I live in Jack Fisher Park on the creek. I am a widow. My son is leaving for college. My daughter is here. I've recently purchased cameras. My dog was shot. So I've tried. Okay? I've tried to do my part to make myself safe. I would like to live here. I feel like I need to make a choice sometime in the next six months seeing which direction this is going to go in. 
in, since the, the, the homeless were released from the riverbed and they've dispersed themselves onto the creeks in back of my property now, I've had two intruders in my backyard. The police were very prompt in coming. I have had a homeless encampment at the foot of the riverbed. Again, the police were very prompt in coming. But this was, you know, this was a tarp, and then there was a tent, and then there was a cot inside, and then the police came, and then they had to put a note and say the next day the park is going to come and remove your stuff. I, I feel bad because that's the guy's stuff, but in point of fact, he's not allowed to camp there. The next door neighbor had, uh, in the bramble behind their house, in the creek property, had uh, a couple living behind the wall. There were five suitcases, a Monopoly board set up, and a ball gown hanging on a hanger. So these aren't people who are transient. These are people who are trying to live. And so I'd like to stay in Santa Ana. I'd like my property to rehold its value, and I'd like my daughter and me to be safe. Um, I appreciate the efforts that they're making. I've seen the, the outreaches with the homeless um, that, we're, that we're trying to do. But um, I, I guess my point is I'm a homeowner, and I do have some choices. I'd like to stay here and I hope that my voice will be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gre Greg Eisenma, and if I pronounced your last name, please correct it for me, sir. Followed by uh, Board Member Cecilia Iglesias. Hi, my name is Greg Eisenman. I live at 2453 North Riverside Drive. Um, I live in front of where the fire was last night, and um, I'm here with my wife tonight. Uh, my wife's really worried about the house that we purchased two years ago and all the homeless that are behind us. She's called uh, numerous times to get graffiti removed, and it takes at least a week, two weeks, to get the graffiti removed behind us. Um, it's, it's getting to be really bad back there since uh, we closed off the, the riverbed in front of Anaheim uh, Stadium. And um, I know as part of the association, I, I don't want to be here complaining, but uh, what can we do as neighbors to um, help the issue? What can the police department do for us? Um, and how can this be a win-win situation? Because right now, as you hear all the neighbors, we're, we're, we're scared to be in our homes. So um, thanks for listening, and uh, we hope we can be part of the solution. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker is Ms. Cecilia Iglesias. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Cecilia Iglesias. I am a um, trustee for the Santa Ana, Santa Ana Unified School District Board of Education, and I'm also a resident of Windsor Village Neighborhood Association. I just um, want to come and share my concerns about our park, Centennial Park. Um, there is a lot of I would say filth, a lot of dirt and a lot of trash that's been left in, in, our, in, in our park. And I'm hoping that we can address it uh, because uh, as a com community members, neighborhood associations, we don't have access to a beautiful park that once used to be. I know that the school district, Santa Unified School District and the city council, you guys are in conversations about some type of, um, I guess, negotiation or something about having joint use. But I think before we start joint use conversations, we need to clean up the park. I don't know if you guys have seen the lake. The lake is very dirty, and, it's, and it attracts a lot of mosquitoes, and it's not safe for any of our communities. And I know we also have a lot of homeless, even though I want to thank you guys for um, moving them away from the riverbed, because we're not that far from there. But a lot of them are going into the park and then just also camping in there. So um, I just want to I, I want to put this out there, hoping that you guys will help us out as neighborhood association and Windsor Village um, neighborhood association. And also, I want to thank you for um, July Fourth for allowing us to have a um, a nice celebration at the park. But it would have been nicer if we would have had a cleaner park. And I just want to um, put it on on record that um, hopefully for next year, I w I would like to request that we have a Fourth of July parade from the city, for the city to um, sponsor it. I know other cities do that on the 4th of July, and um, one, one thing that's really bothered me was that one of our schools, which is Sigerstrom, uh, Sigerstrom, Inter sorry, Sigerstrom Fundamental School, they uh, participated in a parade, and it was in Huntington Beach. So I'm hoping that if we could have something like that so we could have our own students participate, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Board Member Iglesias. Uh, we're now going to go to, um, there is, I'm hope, uh, will you be around for a while, uh, Board Member? 
Iglesias? Okay. Because there's something about Centennial Park, I think, that in the comments section I could bring up that maybe we could work on together. Um, let's go ahead and go to our agenda items. Uh, item number one, approval of the minutes. I second. Okay. So I'll motion second. <laughs> uh, that's approved. Uh, n item number two, make motion. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, and that's approved. So we'll go to item three. Before we go to item three, we do have one speaker, Mr. Tim Johnson. If you can come on up and speak to us. Yeah, hi, everyone. Tim Johnson, I'm West Florida Park um, resident for a number of years now. Um, it seems like we're in a rut with, with police recruitment. You know, we, we're high, we're, you know we've, we've had a push to hire. Um, which is great, but then we have and we hire some people, then we have some some retire, and our net isn't 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 seeming to be impactful. Um, from 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 where I sit, maybe the update we'll get today will will change my mind, which would be great. Um, but it, I, I'm in a line of business that we also have tremendous recruiting problems, and whenever we have recruiting problems, we change what we're doing, and we're and we find other people that are doing things better than we are, and we make those changes. Um, and I would, I would just implore the, uh, um, you know, wh whoever's in charge of that to, to think outside the box to be able to not just go to recruiting fairs and, and job fairs and, and those types of things, which I think most, uh, most hiring departments, that's, that's a, you know, a, a strong, a strong uh, uh, way that other cities are doing things, but it's not seeming to work for us. And so I would just implore uh, the, our, our hiring managers to really think outside the box to be able to find some examples throughout the the U.S. That, that is working in other communities that we can piggyback off of. Um, and just like in the private sector, um, it will we'll start to work. It's not going to be a fast process, but uh, uh, let's, let's make some progress in there. This is impacting our quality of life issues uh, here in Santa Ana. Um, you know, that's a term that we use in, in across multiple disciplines in, in the city. Um, you know, we hear it, we hear it from, from fires to, to uh, homelessness to prostitution uh, to <coughs> cleaning up parks. Um, this this is a major issue for us, of which we have fortunately budgeted positions and they're vacant, and we need to hire those th those folks. And we need to get that get all those positions hired so we can improve our quality of life. And uh, you know our, our police officers are, are are understaffed right now, and it makes their job harder. Um, so we need to do whatever we can to be able to uh, to bring those folks in, and and just consider alternatives uh, that may be available out there. Our police department is one of our, our biggest assets in this in this city, and um, they're here to protect us. Um, we're here to help you guys. Um, so th thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, staff, I'm, we have about eight items. So what I'm going to ask is that uh, the item presentations are between five to ten minutes. Um, and then that way we can have some time for discussion. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to item number three, uh, update on police officer recruitment and hiring. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity to provide an update on our uh, police officer hiring. Again, this year in 1819, we have a total of 383 funded positions. That didn't change from 1718. 370 in the general fund, 11 in special revenue funds, and uh, two in the grants. Uh, we currently have 326 filled, uh, 57 vacancies, which you'll notice is an improvement over uh, what we presented uh, a couple months ago. I believe we we're at 62 vacancies. Um, nine of those positions are filled with uh, police recruits, so not yet sworn, but in the police academy. Uh, so far for 2018, as of June 30th, 2018, we had hired 15 officers, 11 recruits, and four laterals. We currently have 11 recruits in the academy, five in class 232, six in class 233, and there are 10 trainees in the field training program for a total of 21 in various stages of academy and FTO training, which we hope to bring on board obviously as soon as possible, get them trained up so they can start uh, contributing out in the field. Just an update, as far as our recruitment efforts, we do have a new training commander and a new a, um, uh, recruitment corporal in the backgrounds unit who have been providing uh, some significant uh, improvements and uh, um, uh, just uh, progress in terms of our recruiting efforts. What we have 
up on the screen here is just a, a snapshot or cross section of some of the recruitment uh, events that we've had so far this year. Uh, again, reaching out to Santa Ana College, East LA College, uh, Camp Pendleton, Golden West College, and LA Fitness. Um, the LA Fitness and also 24 hour fitness, fitness events that we've had have been highly successful. Uh, a lot of interest from uh, people uh, at those events. Uh, the managers are working really well with us and we're able to do those events at no cost. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, moving forward, we have uh, 13 events uh, currently scheduled. And again, this is just a cross section. We have an event at uh, the Marine Base in Miramar. Uh, we have an event at San Diego State, UC San Diego, Fall Career Fair, Cal State Long Beach, and Cal State San Bernardino. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, recruitment events have been expanded to other areas. So speaking to Mr. Johnson's comments about uh, trying to think outside the box and do some new things, uh, uh, Commander Sorensen and, and Corporal um, uh, Padron have, have been doing a good job at that, uh, really filling the recruitment calendar and doing some new things. Uh, in addition, uh, increasing our social media footprint. Um, they've been making some progress there as well. Just a few quick photos. Uh, the photo on the upper left uh, is our LA Fitness event. Uh, the, um, we have a photo here of uh, Camp Pendleton also on the right, 24-hour uh, fitness uh, on the second photo on the left there. Uh, projected hires. Uh, this is uh, just some numbers that we, we're, we're really excited about. We're looking, at, looking like we're going to have a strong summer uh, with 15 hires projected through October 17th. Uh, you see the, the numbers there that add to the 15. So by October 17th, we're expecting to, to bring on 15 uh, candidates that look really strong right now in the process. So we're, uh, we're excited to bring those individuals on. I uh, wanted to share with you again the Western States average uh, for populations over 250,000. Um, the uh, average is 1.8 per 1,000 residents. Again, Santa Ana uh, is uh, at uh, 0.9. Um, and also the, the Western States, uh, the states that represent the Western region are included there uh, in the mountain area and the Pacific area. And as we bring uh, more and more laterals and recruits on, we, our goal is to get closer and closer to that 1.8 uh, as our recruiting efforts and budget allows. This is information that uh, council members had, re had requested uh, showing the age of our department. So of our 326 officers, we have 37% with less than uh, five years experience, uh, which means we have 63% over five years experience. So uh, you can see there between five and 10 years experience, 10 to 15 years experience, um, obviously not as much hiring going on during those periods of time. Uh, we do have uh, um, thirty-three percent of of the, our sworn force with greater than fifteen years experience, and uh, just a bullet there that thirty we have thirty-seven officers that are age uh, fifty plus. So um, on one hand, those are officers that could retire uh, in the near future. Uh, on a positive note, those are thirty-seven officers that, for various reasons, are deciding to stick around and continue working here at the PD. So. Uh, uh, and we have that experience uh, sticking around, so that's a, a good sign. Um, in terms of our IOD officers or uh, officers injured on duty, um, uh, we're down to 12, uh, six that are off work and six on light duty. And as you know, those, those numbers affect uh, the, the number of, of uh, boots we have on the ground out in the field. So we're sharing those numbers with you. And with that, I'll be pleased to answer any questions. Uh, any questions, uh, Councilmember Villegas? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have about how many? Um, how many officers uh, over fifty? Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven, and uh, most of them apply uh, three at fifty, or they have three at fifty. They're eligible. Yeah, they're, they're eligible to retire at fifty. Yeah, and we're trying to keep them, and so we have. 
15 we've hired and we're looking at another 15 so that would be a total 30 for this year is that 30 through october 17th and then we're hoping we get some laterals and others that come in after that yes okay and how many have retired so far this year uh, so far this year 11 11 and there's going to be more coming there's going to be more yeah we right. project between 25 and 30 on a normal year so we're hoping yeah. hoping this year we'll have Fewer than normal. So we're going to have a few, yeah, fewer than normal. And so my my thing is uh, we're trying to retain our officers. We want them to stay because it's so hard to recruit people, especially with Prop 64 um, affecting everyone because these people start smoking marijuana and they get involved in other things and they're not going to pass background. And a lot of agencies, a lot of cities have the same problem. They have problems hiring quality people. This city here... This is a very, very active city. We need good officers, patient officers, intelligent officers, guys that make good decisions. Not to put down some of the other agencies that are out there, but here, it's very, very busy. You need to be able to, to um, deal with the amount of work. Our officers are overworked right now. We have an average of 408 calls a day, breaks down to about 18 calls an hour, and then we're understaffed. And right now we're operating at half. You've heard me say it in the meetings. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I like to put the facts out there. That's why, to me, it's not fair to any of you. And to me, this position is only temporary. I'm not going to be here forever. When I leave, I will be back out in the city like everyone else. And when I pick up the phone and I call for someone to show up, it would be great if they would show up in a reasonable amount of time, just like everywhere else in this county. When you call, help will come. You shouldn't have to have an emergency, or your house burning, or um, you being attacked and then no one shows up. That's just unacceptable. And I fight for this because I'm like everyone else. I'm a resident here too. And I, and I don't deserve any special treatment. I've never done it here at the Sheriff's, you know, you know I work at the Sheriff's Department. I never... I never use my position to get special treatment, ever, because I know it'll come back and, and get me. But at the same time, you know, I shouldn't have to say anything. I shouldn't have to say I'm a councilman, send someone, you know, right away. No. All of us pay taxes. All of us live here. All of us should be treated equal. And, you know, and I won't stand for it. If there's anything I do is to, that while I'm, while I'm here, and who knows how long I'll be here, I need to make a difference. If not, I wasted my time here. What will my family say about me? Hey, you went up there and you didn't do anything? It's hard to explain that. I am here to help. And uh, we have a problem here with the homeless taking over you know, uh, neighborhoods. We have the prostitution problem. We know we've had this problem for a very long time, but we need to have personnel to deal with this problem continuously. That way we can somewhat control it at least you know this thing is uh, it's been going on for years and years and years and years and i've been out here almost 30 years and you know we need to tackle this we have to take care of our children in our schools every my daughter goes to Seagerstrom. every time i hear of a school getting on lockdown and i hear it on the radio when i'm at work i want to leave there and come over here to find out what's going on it makes my stomach turn i'm a dad I'm a single dad, so I really, really worry about this. It's just uh, it's unacceptable. And another thing is, um, you know, every part of the city has this thing. So you got the prostitution problem, you got the homeless problem, you have graffiti, you have the gangs, you have speeding cars, you have people just firing off guns, you have loud music, you have regular calls for service. Chief, how many DV calls do we have a year? I think you gave me a number. In 2017, we had like... How many calls do you remember approximately? About 4,000. Yeah. 4,000 calls for domestic violence. And those are calls that are kind of iffy because most people, you know, as you know, if you're in a relationship, you hesitate before you pick up that phone to call. So we need to address this. There is nothing more that I would like to do than to hire more officers. We have some of the money that we have money that's dedicated funded positions right now and it's just very very tough so i have you know i applaud our department our police department for you know the the increase in recruiting 
And um, if we could do more, I would. It's just there. It's just tough. We have people retiring, and we're trying to bring people in, and we want to bring quality people in. Because if we bring in, if we lower the standards, if we bring someone else here, it's going to cost us in lawsuits. And you know we had a couple of shootings this week. This is no joke out here. Police work is no joke wherever you are. How much is a human life worth? you got to ask yourself that. So when I say our officers need to be competitive and pay, because, look, when you go look for employment, don't you look at the flyer and say, well, this is what kind of the job, what are the duties? And the first thing you look at is what does it pay and what are the benefits? Because that's what your family is going to live off of. And these guys here, these men and women risking their lives out there every single day overworked and log on the computer when they go on duty and they're backlogged 20 calls right from the get-go it's tough and they should be compensated and i think we should continue to uh, look for ways to retain them and to um, make it more attractive because in police work it's all about word of mouth and recruitment i know we have to do outreach but most cops know other people that want to be officers and they talk to them look between us and the mouse, Anaheim, Anna, the mouse pays well. Why, you know, I should go over there and, or Newport or Irvine. So um, that's the reality of things. And uh, that's my comment, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank, thank you, you. Councilmember Viegas, and thank you for your comments. Um, what we are trying to do right now is, uh, and Mr. Viegas is part of this too, is we're trying to create some, some solvency to make us more attractive without hurting the city and there's ideas that we have right now in place the reality too though is that we're moving into a different economy as well and uh, revenue is something that we're looking at to bring in rev more revenue to, to retain some of our older officers to give us that seniority that we need at the same time retain the younger officers uh, I was I, I grew up in Santa Ana and I was here in the 90s when things got out of control and it was very, very difficult to get them back into control. It took us about eight years uh, to, to really start to bring businesses back. So uh, public safety, quality of life issues that I've heard you speak about today, this is a major part of this. And so one of the things that um, I don't want to pretend like I know how to recruit because I don't know how to cre recruit officers, but something that I thought about as, you, as I was looking at the places that you were going, I noticed and, and I was appreciative that you were looking at the L.A. area and San Diego area. Um, I, I, I want to ask if it's possible to, to take a look at the Fresno, up, go all the way up to Fresno and see if we can start recruiting some officers from there. Because let me tell you this right now. I'd rather live here than live in um, Fresno. I shouldn't say that out loud. I'm, I'm sorry. That was bad, 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 bad chair. So anyhow, uh, thank you for that. We're going to go to item number four. We do have some speakers on number item uh, number item number four. I'd like to call up. Uh, actually, we have one speaker, Miss uh, Esther Fonseca. If you could come on up. Good evening, everyone. Yes, my name is Esther Fonseca. I am on the board of directors for the Aticia Pilar Neighborhood Association, and I am the person who first brought the problems of loud and raucous music in the city to this committee's attention on January the 9th of this year. I have reviewed the document presented by Assistant City Attorney Tamara Bogosian at your last committee meeting held on May the 8th, containing recommendations revision to the loud and raucous noise municipal code. I see Ms. Bogosian is here, hello. I have two uh, suggested additions and a question regarding the proposed revisions. I believe these additions will be helpful in that they will clarify the legal wording of the document by citing specific examples so there is no confusion by the public as to what is and is not allowed. I now refer to the document. Uh, I don't know if you have it on you there, but um, on section B, it states that the words loud and raucous noise, end quote, are used he as used herein shall mean any sound or recording thereof, etc. I would like to suggest that you add in this section for purposes of clarification of the word, quote, sound, end quote, the following wording. The word sound shall include but not be limited to sound emitting, fr emitting from stereos, radios, vehicle radios, DJs, karaoke machines, and live bands. I very strongly believe citing these specific examples of sources of, what, of the sound will be helpful in clearing up confusion as to what is allowed and what is prohibited. As an example, in my neighborhood, Articia Pilar is the largest in the city. We have a serious 
recurring problem with people having live bands at their parties in their front yards and driveways. It is my hope that handing out the new revised code citing these examples of what is prohibited and including the resulting fines will discourage these abuses. Also under section C, uh, which reads, which defines unreasonably and mentions uh, consideration of the hour, I would like to suggest that you add at the end of the sentence, quote, the provisions of this code are in effect and shall be enforced at any time within a 24 hour day. The reason for this is that people think it is all right to play music during the day or before 10 p.m. I have encountered these common misunderstandings with my neighbors and during our neighborhood association meetings. Finally, I have a question, but apparently in looking over your, uh, you have added to the proposed revisions for this meeting, uh, I had a question under section E, uh, the nut second number two reads, each notice of violation shall contain the following information the date, and then in parentheses, there's an S, on which the person violated the code. Uh, what does dates mean? But apparently, um, because of, up above it refers to for the event, meaning I, I believe that we would refer to one incident. But now you have added, which is I think a very, very excellent idea, you've rec uh, added for the purposes of this meeting a new revision that re refers to a 30-day period, which is outstanding. I have neighbors all over my neighborhood and behind me that literally I'm having to call. We could wrap up, Ms. Fonseca. Two weeks, every three weeks. So please, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. And that brings us to item number four. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Uh, without going through in detail the um, actual slides that we presented at the lap prior meeting, I'm going to go straight to what the committee had requested um, that we follow up on, and that was on the definition of person as well as the definition of subsequent response. So we provided you here on this slide uh, recommended revisions and options for the committee to consider, uh, of course, no action being taken today, but just for discussion, that the word subsequent means any and all occasions within a 30-day period after the initial response, when one or more officers are dispatched to the scene of a party gathering or event. Um, the second option is if, it's, if they're dispatched to a same or different party gathering or similar event. Um, those are some of the options available. We looked at various ordinances and statutes throughout um, Orange County, and these were some ideas that we uh, came up with, as well as uh, the discussion at the last meeting had to do with whether or not what, would, what the city would be able to do if the event organizer was a minor. And so we've included here that if the person in charge of the premises um, where the loud and raucous noise originates is a minor, each parent or legal guardian who resides, owns, or controls the premises from which the music or loud, raucous noise originates shall be deemed liable. And then I also included there an option that the committee could consider um, to in that they'll be jointly and severally liable for all fines, penalties, and assessments. Um, with that, I am available to answer any questions. Councilmember Villegas? I don't have any questions at this time. And uh, I think it's, there's a fine line. I, I, I think there's good work that's been, uh, that you've been doing here and some, uh, some very uh, good adjustments to what your revisions have come forth. There's a fine line where we have to be careful to, uh, to um, what, in other words, we, we don't, do we discuss decibel level noises or anything? No, we're not including the definition of decibel. If you see here that we've included our actual ordinance currently defines loud and raucous noise as any sound or any recording. And it doesn't include decibel levels. It gives the officers essentially the option to determine whether it unreasonably interferes with the peace and quiet of persons. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, that'll bring us to item number five. And I do not have any speakers for item number five. That's the verbal update on policing philosophy and chief's uh, five-year strategic plan. Chief Valentin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly provide an update uh, uh, to everyone here and the public on these two initiatives that I discussed um, at our last meeting and kind of the progress that we've made. The first one being the uh, policing philosophy. This is um, the piece centered on how we deliver policing services in the city of Santa Ana. And so this was last revised in 2016, 
Um, having uh, taken over the police department earlier this year, uh, I think it's important to revisit this piece. Um, so internally, we've established a committee of, of 10 members uh, of the police department, representatives throughout the organization. Um, we had an initial meeting. Um, and then part of this I also shared was to uh, have an opportunity where the public can provide input on what it is um, their uh, priorities are and what they would like to um, include as suggestions in a policing philosophy. So we do have um, a couple of um, sessions that we're going to schedule for the month of August. They'll be widely advertised, um, whether they're here in the police community room or at different sites uh, throughout the city. Uh, there'll be at least two, and then we'll probably add a couple more. We have seek the assistance of the Orange County Human Relations uh, Commission as well to assist us in that process, uh, just to facilitate. Uh, so we've met with them, and they're uh, more than uh, willing and excited to, to assist us. Um, the target uh, to publicize a final product is on or about November 1st of this year. Um, so that's where we are with that um, initiative. Um, and then moving on to the um, five-year strategic plan, that uh, uh, initiative drills down on what it is exactly we're going to focus and concentrate on. It's a blueprint. The philosophy is how we do business. The strategic plan is what the specific uh, goals and objectives we look to accomplish. Um, so that there was a kickoff meeting there. Again, 10 committee members made up from members throughout the organization. Um, community uh, input meetings will also be facilitated. Uh, dates for that are still pending. This initiative um, will uh, be accomplished into the first quarter of 2019. It's a little more in depth. We don't have a basis to work from. The policing philosophy, we've always had one. Um, I do see there a need to revise that. So, but that's really just a revision uh, initiative. So that's where we are uh, on that piece. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Nope. And I don't have any questions on that. Thank you very much, Chief, for doing a great job. Well, that's going to bring us to item number six. And I do have a speaker, Mr. Tim Johnson, if you could approach the mic, please. Hi again. I look forward to the Chief's update on the 4th of July uh, activity in the city. Um, as, I, as I drove around some other cities approaching, approaching Independence Day, um, I noticed a lot of cities have uh, you know, big signs, whether that billboard or whether electronic signage on the streets, you know, similar to the ones that we would be saying, you know, this lane's going to be closed at this time of period. And that they're highly advertising these types of, uh, of activity um, w with regards to the city's philosophy with, uh, with fireworks. Um, we, 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 all, we all live in the city, and um, uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing these, uh, the, the, the bombs that are going off, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, and these are obviously, we're talking about illegal fireworks. I'm not talking about safe and sane fireworks that uh, my kids enjoy setting off uh, and uh, enjoying and buying at, buying at local stands that are supporting local, uh, local charities. Um, but, you know, I feel like we need to do a better job of, uh, of, of educating. Um, now, that only goes so far. I mean, obviously, a lot of the folks that are doing this type of stuff, they know it's illegal. They, they know it's wrong. Um, and so uh, my next experience was I, I spent Fourth of July day down, down, uh, down on the peninsula, which uh, if anyone's ever spent Fourth of July down there, it's a pretty intense uh, uh, area down there, too, with a number of people, some, uh, some activity that's going on that maybe shouldn't be going on. And th their police force, I saw, I saw the same three police officers walk, Walk, walk by us um, and during the day uh, no less than four times. I mean, they, they know where some problem areas are at. Where we are staying, they're definitely, there's definitely party central. And so th they're targeting those areas. Uh, they're, they're listening to the community. They, got, they have police officers on the ground. Uh, and and I, I, would say, I would say that may, maybe we, we need to take, uh, take on some of that same philosophy here. Of we, we know that you ask the citizens where the, where the, uh, fire, where the illegal fireworks are going to be going off. They're, they're going to tell you. Um, and the response that, that, that we're getting when we unfortunately do, do, do indicate that to dispatch is, well, when it, when it happens, you let us know. Okay, well, we all know what, what happens then. By the time any, there's any response, everything's gone. Um, and so the Newport Beach on the peninsula, they, they, they were proactive. They know where the, the, the activity is going to be at. They have, they, they have folks assigned to that area. Those, those same three police officers, they weren't all through the city. They were just you know, assigned to where we were at. 
and uh, you know, focusing in on, on that activity, uh, which made it a lot safer for my kids. I got three kids, ages eight, ten, and twelve. Um, you know, I want I want to enjoy Fourth of July. They want to enjoy Fourth of July. We all want to do it safely, as I as I know you guys do also. Um, so just maybe taking a target uh, target approach uh, with, with the regards to this matter. And you know, if we're not going to, let's just say it. And let's just say that hey, we're not going to. Um, and then and, and then at least we're being honest with our with our residents here. Um, if there's not going to be any enforcement, uh, let's control expectations. Let's communicate that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chief, uh, item six, summary of 4th of July operational period activity. Uh, yes, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, so this uh, past 4th of July um, was a very busy uh, period, as many residents have, have commented. Uh, but I want to just um, share the highlights of, of what was put together in response. Two-pronged approach. First was education, um, educating the public on um, you know, the use of uh, safe and sane fireworks as opposed to illegal fireworks, and then what the uh, enforcement would be following um, possession usage of illegal fireworks. Um, we had 160 different community outreach education initiatives uh, activities, individual actions, 160 of them. Last year there was 110. So we've increased that, and that I can discuss um, some of those. Partnered with uh, Orange County Fire Authority, conducted a PSA in English and Spanish, partnered with Santa Ana College, used their marquee for signage, partnered with uh, Santa Ana Unified School District for distribution of uh, flyers, social media platform across the board using Facebook, Nixle, Twi Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat postings from the police department. Um, attended city's mandatory vendor uh, meeting uh, to promote anti-illegal fireworks campaign. Um, so a variety of different initiatives and letting people know that they're not to um, in engage in uh, illegal fireworks uh, possession, usage, sales, um, et cetera. Uh, then beyond that, the enforcement, um, we, we did take a more uh, concerted effort uh, this year as opposed to last year. Um, we, last year we had 395 calls for service. Um, this year we had 462 calls for service. Uh, last year we made one arrest. Uh, this year we made 11 arrests. Uh, last year we issued 16 administrative sites. Uh, this year we issued 25. Um, in addition to that, uh, some additional proactive activity was, um, uh, let's see here, the total number of citations um, on, the, on the 4th was 22, um, uh, the previous day was zero, and, and, and so on. Um, so, so the approach was um, a bit more aggressive this year as opposed to last year, but I, I think it's important um, as you hear the numbers of staffing, right? In order to um, facilitate uh, these enforcement actions, we need to do them safely. And I'll illustrate uh, one incident that occurred involving one of our police officers. Actually occurred on July 4th at about 10, 12 p.m. in the area of 700 South Lyon. Um, we responded um, uh, to provide actually security for the fire authority that was dealing with uh, personnel having um, fireworks there and, and, uh, and that. Uh, so. Uh, from the crowd, uh, someone uh, threw a mortar. Um, so th that's essentially a, a quarter stick of dynamite, right? Um, that landed um, in the um, duty belt of a police officer and wedged um, between his belt and his duty belt. Um, quick thinking, uh, he removed that item and kicked it away. It ended up uh, um, lodged underneath a uh, patrol um, car. When it detonated, it disabled the car, uh, could not be driven. So just in terms of the safety aspect and element that we're having to address as well, we had to call in two uh, mobile field force teams, uh, 20 officers, uh, to clear that area safely. Uh, but um, by the grace of God, we, we could have had a very um, tragic incident involving one of our officers, uh, up to and including death. So it, it, it is a, a continued challenge. We did take a bit of a different approach this year and issued additional administrative sites. Uh, we did have some undercover operations as well uh, and confiscated uh, illegal fireworks prior to the 4th um, as well. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Question, uh, Chief Black. 
the uh, call on South Lion was uh, <clears throat> the reason that OCFA was there was because there was a firework that went off in someone's hand, I'm told? Yes, um, I believe that was the 17-year-old. Um, yes, 17-year-old um, juvenile playing with uh, illegal fireworks had one detonate in his hand. Um, significant, significant damage to his hand. Brought a lot of attention around from the crowd. Um, and that that is what led up to our request of Santa Ana PD for basically security of our personnel. And it became uh, quite a tense situation there for a good half an hour for our folks um, as well as uh, SAPD. So were the fire, your firefighters also attacked? Were they had, did they have any uh, of those illegal fireworks tossed at you or shot at you? Um, yes, the initial response um, was for immediate code three because they had what our folks were describing as bombs going off. It was those uh, little quarter sticks of dynamite going off all over the place, yeah. I'm told that there was a lot of residents in the surrounding apartments came out and they were starting to get a big old crowd. You had a call for the police assistance uh, or chief, maybe you can speak to this. And I, I heard that Deputy Chief Kaminsky did a great job. He was very close before calling other cities to come in and help. Uh, is that, can you talk about that, speak about that? Yeah, and that's, that's what, um, and Deputy Chief Kaminsky um, was out in the field in addition to a field commander. Um, under the circumstances, they did a tremendous job. Uh, that, that is on point. Um, so in, in addition to the uh, two mobile field force squads, which again is 20 officers, um, you know, that escalated to that point. Um, a call could have been made for mutual aid. It, they determined it wasn't required, uh, but that would have been the next level of response. So that is having a neighboring city respond Correct. for help Correct. because our officers are being overrun. Keep in mind that every other city that has um, Safe and Sane is dealing with their own issues and then, of course, all the illegal uh, fireworks that are out there as well. Right. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate the, the briefing on that. And uh, thank you because uh, it has been very much out of hand in, in, other, in recent years. I, I, uh, we still had illegal fireworks and so forth. We're a very large city, extremely difficult to patrol. I'm on the south end, and I saw some coming out of a gated community. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> and they weren't going up very high, which also concerned me. But um, I, I do believe that you're making, you're starting to make inroads, and we're starting to to um, find out where the a lot of the hot spots are. And um, I, I commend you for that. So um, we'll just uh, gear up and 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 strategize for the next years. So, and uh, I thank you for your leadership on that. Santa Ana is uh, 27.2 square miles with 343,000 residents, so very different to police that than uh, Newport, yeah. Newport and <laughs> other areas, but you know, it but is what it is. But you still do what you can, and you always yes, think sir. outside the box to make it work, so thank you for that. Let's go to uh, item number seven. We do have two speakers for item number seven. Ms. Tanya, please correct me, because I know I'm, I'm probably going. Today it's been... Say it one more time. Change the Y to E, sound it out, and it's easy. Change the Y to an E. Skrzynski. I knew that. I was just I testing you. I married a nice you. Polish man. I was just testing you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm a resident of Jack Fisher Park, and I have been in Santa Ana for 15 years, and it's been an amazing city. Um, a few years ago, maybe five years ago, I had read how we were an up-and-coming city, one of the safest cities to live in. And we were really proud of that. We actually bought additional properties in Santa Ana. We moved our kids close to us so that we could be a family and watch our kids and our grandchildren grow. And um, that has not been the case as the last few years. Um, I've been at other council meetings, and I know you guys listen, and I appreciate it. Um, Santa Ana PD has been great at responding and helping as well as educating us on what to do. Um, but the problem's only getting worse, not better. And it's really hard on us when you ask us as taxpayers and residents to do all of our obligations and duties and not leave our trash laying around and make sure that our paint's not peeling off our houses and all these code enforcement th things that we have to comply with. But yet as taxpayers and people that are trying to help you with revenue to hire more officers and whatnot, you let this homeless community grow out of control. We really need to get a handle on it because every day it gets worse. The trash is, that they leave behind is piling up. Nobody in this community would have a problem sharing our, our parks with them if they didn't leave their trash and all of their paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia and all that behind. I don't know what happened to 
drug free zones in our park. That doesn't happen anymore. There's there's people shooting it up. I've seen people smoking in our parks, all these things that our kids should not be seeing, along with being able to play in a playground that's safe with not having to step over needles or have a needle pricked in them. So it's just a really bad situation. Jack Fisher Park would be very helpful if you could take the park benches in the back and move them forward and block off that access way, maybe put a basketball court or something lit back there. That would help uh, tremendously if you can pull those benches from the back to the front. Um, And then the other thing is... um, I think that's pretty much it. There's just no repercussion for them, but we have to pay, you know, deal with all of the consequences of it. So it would be really helpful if you guys could do that. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry you have to come out and give us a report on that, but we do appreciate it, and we do listen to that. Uh, Mr. Tim Johnson. Yeah, you guys again. Um, I know that my, 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 our two esteemed council members have heard me speak uh, uh, a number of times on this topic at, at, at council, various council meetings, but um, the, our homeless situation is, is dire. I, you know, as I'm talking to neighbors, um, you know, I, I've transformed my opinion on the homeless issues after going to numerous UCI uh, events, United Way events, Jamboree housing, uh, meeting with Heather Stratman at AOC, AOC, meeting with Supervisor Doe's office, meeting with uh, Supervisor Bartlett's office, meeting with Mayor Wagner down at Irvine complaining about their, their response. Multiple type of education items, and I feel like we need to educate our community about the homeless, the homeless issues. Otherwise, um, everything is anecdotal. Um, we need to, uh, uh, to to work towards a solution here, uh, and that solution is permanent supportive housing. Um, you know, every time, the, the, even the issue that we're, we're seeing seeing in, in our communities, uh, they're they're centralizing. They, oh, it's, it's just rotational. You know, we, we we move them from one spot to another. Um, that neighborhood says, "Oh, good." The next neighborhood says, "What just happened?" Um, this not solving any issues when we're when we're moving people around. The the way that you solve homelessness is you the, the, they need a door. They need a door that they can lock from the inside, not from the outside. Meaning a jail cell. Um, permit supportive housing is the solution on this, and we need we we need to support um, a solution countywide. And but the city is part of that. Yes, we've carried more than our fair share of, of water. Uh, we have big shoulders, and we can do that. But we need to we need to encourage others, and whether that's through legal means, which I know we've started down that road, and then we pull back, and then we start again, we pull back. Um, but, 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 but it's super important, and we need to educate the folks. I, I came from a, a, a perspective of, hey, the homeless, would just arrest them all. We'll give them housing. The housing is in the jail, okay? I moved from there to, no, this, that's not, that's not going to solve anything. It's permanent supportive housing is a solution on this. I'm a, I'm a super fiscal, financial, conservative type person. When I, when I hear that the money and the compassion align, with this matter, I mean, why is this not on fire instead of the creek bed on fire for a permanent support of housing? It's because the education isn't there to be able to educate our, our residents that, hey, when you convert a dilapidated motel into permanent support of housing, guess what happens to that community? Property values go up, okay? Crime goes down. We have police officers that now can go focus in other areas throughout the city. This is super important. And Ms. Keika, I, I, I support you in what you're doing, and I, just, I hope the, the city council will support you on, on, on Tuesday and direct you, well, I don't know if that's supporting you or not, but direct you to, do, uh, to come up with a permit supported housing plan for the city and include emergency housing in there because that's part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, for those that are uh, not aware, we have an individual who specializes in this. We just brought her on board a few months ago. She's doing a heck of a job. And uh, that is Ms. Hafsa Keka. If you could go ahead and give us your report. Is this on? Okay. Um, Good evening, uh, committee members, as well as the general public. Um, In honoring Council Member Tiene Hero's directive for five to ten minutes. I'm going to try to go as fast as possible. Um, Please bear with me. And then also, um, I'm battling a cold, so please bear with me. Um, First of all, thank you so much for those comments, Tim. I really appreciate that. And the rest of the public in terms of your investment in being here today and uh, essentially talking about the homeless issue. It is important to all of us, and we are here for that. Um, So in the last... um, 
In the last Public Safety Code Enforcement and Neighborhood Empowerment meeting, I talked a little bit about three major projects that we had done since the inception of when I started here, which was February of this past year, of this year. And we had talked about the 2018 draft homeless plan. We had talked about the point in time count, and we had talked about the Civic Center Plaza operation. So those were three very large projects, and um, I provided an update on that. So today, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about more of the short-term, immediate responses that we have done since the last meeting. Um, number one, quality of life, Santiago Creek cleanup project, the Orange County Needle Exchange, which I know that Chief Valentin will also be providing some update to, uh, Judge Carter and the Santa Ana Homeless Update, which actually has three subcategories to it, aggressive or intrusive solicitation on ordinance, and of course, ongoing general homeless services. <clears throat> and again, I'll be speaking a little fast, but I'll be available afterwards to answer any questions. So real quick, I'm not going to go sentence by sentence. This is going to be real fast. Quality of life, as you know, the city has invested in the quality of life. And the quality of life team is a multidisciplinary team that is comprised of our Santa Ana PD, our Parks and Rec, Public Works, as well as community development and community preservation, and um, with the um, advice and counsel of city attorney and city manager's office. Uh, the quality of life team is also available through an app. and. And what happens is that you can call, any constituent or businessman could call for an active encampment to address that. As of January 2018, which was week 23, we had uh, contacted about 1,141 individuals, responded to 735 locations, and addressed 797 encampments. And I really want to be able to uh, provide kudos to all members of the um, quality of life team, especially the Public Works Department, who does the nitty gritty work in getting all of the um, neighborhood cleaned up. Santiago Creek cleanup effort. <clears throat> this was a direct response to the community uh, back in order to remediate impacts to residents and businesses. Uh, two day, a two-day effort was taken place, uh, especially with uh, a lot of the uh, Public Works staff. Um, but we had about 450 total staff hours that were dedicated for the City of Santa Ana Public Works Agency in partnership with the Colt team, which is the quality of life. Um, where when completed the Santiago Creek cleanup project, um, which was successfully removing the rubbish and debris in a massive two-day event. Um, and it was a cleanup as well as an outreach to the homeless individuals out there. You could see a picture there. As I mentioned, 450 total staff hours were dedicated, eight tons of debris, which was 14 truckloads, removed 50 hypodermic needles in order to keep the environment safe, 364 tags of graffiti, and 20 homeless individuals were encountered and offered resources and outreached, as well as um, provided oversight to zero accepted the services. Orange County Needle Exchange, this is also a direct response to the businesses and constituents. Back in December of last year, our city manager um, terminated a memorandum of agreement with the Orange County Needle Exchange due to negative impacts that our community felt, as one of the constituents just mentioned today. Dirty needles being found, that would be a um, detriment to our community. Uh, we found that the California Department of Public Health and you'll also find some of that paperwork up there. Uh, the California Department of Public Health is um, declaring that there could be a mobile needle exchange through the Orange County Mobile through the Orange County Needle Exchange for a few cities, including Santa Ana, Anaheim, Orange, and Costa Mesa. We took proactive action. What we did was we rallied our um, our city departments together, and we went ahead and created, I think it was about 120 to 150 pages of documents that were from our public works department, from our parks and rec, from our police department, from our public library, from our community and business neighborhood, indicating essentially the negative impact the community had felt, um, including pictures, including testimonials, including um, concerns. And we went ahead and submitted that to the California Public Department of Health. We are hoping that that is going to be heard. In addition, several other cities also, including the ones that I just prefaced that this mobile needle exchange was proposed to, uh, they 
also cited Santa Ana um, as their reference to uh, not accept this needle exchange and oppose it. So we became a, um, a model for that. Um, so we took this proactive action and we are hoping that it's not going to be passed. You can also go on to um, our homeless website at Addressing Homelessness in Santa Ana, and you'll get um, about, I think it's Appendix A through G, that prefaces every single piece of letter that supports it, supports the opposition. Judge Carter in Santa Ana Homeless Update. So as you all know that there is a presiding judge, a federal judge, uh, overseeing a civil rights case that has to do with the county and the Catholic um, Workers Association that represents seven individuals that are homeless. And that really was the impetus to the Anaheim um, Riverbed removal. Um, there has been ongoing conversations, ongoing meetings with our city manager's office, with our city attorney's office, um, with my role as well, and um, trying to ensure that we have active coordination. What we we had back in um, June 5th was at 5 a.m. The judge requested that city officials, as long as count, as well as county officials, show up at the Santa Ana Armory to see the download of individuals and the impact to the Santa Ana community. Residents from the Santa Ana Neighborhood Alliance also showed up, and we appreciate that. Um, this was essentially to give sight to how the in, the Santa Ana community is being impacted, especially the mental health association um, that is in the surrounding area. Um, Judge Carter also led a group of individuals, and we do have our pro tem mayor Martinez right there speaking on how the railroad has been a huge issue. And most importantly, Judge Carter informed the Union Pacific Railroad officials that they too need to begin providing resources and address the issue of encampments on railroads as it is a negative to our community. Mental Health Association, this is a lot, but bottom line, we as a city went ahead and um, entered into letters uh, publicly, as well as a public comment by myself and um, Councilman Sarmiento regarding the approval agreement for the Multi-Services Center, MHA, in our city. We thought that this would be a wonderful opportunity for other cities to take part and take on this um, alternative location for this um, for this uh, multi, multi service center. Unfortunately, the Board of Supervisors approved the agreement, so the multi service center remains in the city of Santa Ana. But we went ahead and we did speak to the fact that there were many disturbances in the community, especially the surrounding schools. We will continue to work with the city and the county to address these issues. Aggressive or intrusive solicitation order ordinance. <clears throat> our city council our city council did approve a uh, adopted the aggressive or intrusive solic solicitation ordinance on May 21st with a purpose and intent to protect the set to protect the safety and welfare of the public improving the quality of life and enhancing economic um, vitality for the city this primarily imposed reasonable time place and manner on restrictions on aggressive and intrusive solicitation by individuals at aforementioned areas and then lastly <clears throat> ongoing general homeless services efforts. As you know, we do have our six point plan in our 2018 homeless draft, which speaks to permanent supportive housing, which speaks to outreach and supportive services, strategic planning, along with policy development as well at the legislative le level in order to secure funds to be able to assist us in this homeless crisis. We also speak to the regional collaboration that we ask the other cities and the county to um, meet as well. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions? I do want to say that picture is of our district, um, D.C. Gominski and Corporal Montiel as well, and a couple of our wonderful SAPD who were highlighted in one of the um, Orange County, I think, register, or yes, to their wonderful work, and I just thought that was really cool. It is cool. Is their face dark because they're not attractive? Or <laughs> I'm just teasing. Oh, and lastly but not least, um, we also, at the request of many of you, we have, put, we have published our homeless fact sheet. This speaks to all of our efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Villegas, any questions? Um, <coughs> Chief Valentin, since you're on point regarding the uh, needle exchange, where are you with that? So, uh, can I, uh, I'm sorry. No, I. I do we want to go to that now, or because it's on the item next? Or Isn't that the same one? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. He's going to speak to it. So well, we'll go, we'll, we'll, you're going to speak to that in the next item. Okay. No further questions regarding that item. We'll Thank you very much next. for your report. Um, and so, with that, we will go to item number eight. We do have one speaker, Mr. Tim Johnson. Can you approach the mic, please? Yeah. Hi again. Um, 
lots of important stuff tonight. So, um, with, with regards to the Orange County Needle Exchange, we should be. Uh, I mean, the, the, the pr program administrators really should be honest with themselves and, and, and consider this to be the central Orange County needle exchange. I don't think they have any proposed sites throughout uh, other parts of the, uh, of the county besides uh, up, up here in the cent central area. Um, Irvine is, uh, I think, either the third or fourth uh, largest uh, city with, uh, in terms of unsheltered individuals, um, not homeless, but unsheltered individuals, if I recall correctly, uh, living in cars and, and, and that type of stuff. Um, I don't. I don't think they're on their list. And you got to. You got to ask yourself why that is, because they're they're, they're put. They're pushing. They're, they don't even have to do what we're doing. They don't even have to submit letters because because they they know it's a non-starter. Um, and so we we need to be able to. I I, com I commend the letter writing. I commend the, uh, that type of stuff. And we need to hold strong on, on this type of item. Um, it, this is a major quality of life issue. I mean, obviously we we, we have some health 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 issues that, that that need to be addressed also. But th but this is not the. Uh, this doesn't seem to be the solution uh, for it. So um, I, I would uh, uh, re request that we continue to uh, to. Oppose, uh, oppose this. It would be taking a step backwards to where we were um, a, a, a year or two ago before, before it got shut down. Um, and uh, just one, one quick uh, additional thing uh, from, from Ms. Keiko's presentation. The reason why we're having people not accept services is because the service is bad in terms of the, uh, in terms of the shelter being provided. In, in my business, if I, have a, if I have a product that no one wants, what do I do? I change it. Okay? That's, what, that's what entrepreneurs have to do. If we have, we, the, the, the homeless don't want what we are providing. Let's change it. We have some of the smartest minds in the country that deal with land use of issues here in, the, um, here in Orange County. We need to change our product. Okay? And that's where permanent support of housing comes in. That's where emergency housing, I'm not calling it shelters. Okay? Shelters have a bad mm -hmm. connotation. It's emergent, you know, we have to redevelop what, we're, what we think of as, as services that are being provided from the people on the street. Otherwise, we're going to continue to get what we're having, which is not acceptable to your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that brings us to, um, thank you, Mr. Johnson. That brings us to item number eight, uh, needle exchange, Chief Valentine. Thank you, sir. Um, most of the highlighted points that I have to add were already covered in the previous presentation. I saw them as part of the content, but I think they were relevant in context to what you were presenting, so I, we kept them there. Um, but essentially, the uh, OCNEP's uh, application to the state requires that there be um, official um, input by the top law enforcement official. In that case, that's me. Um, so I went ahead and uh, submitted a letter on June 8th, um, strongly opposing uh, their proposed uh, program and let me just say this uh, briefly I, I and I don't think anybody in the city's position is that we are against a, a program such as this because it is addressing the the spread of disease we understand that the problem has been from inception is the irresponsible manner in which this program was implemented upon us in the Civic Center area impacting our employees our visitors and even the surrounding neighborhoods we found uh, one bag with uh, 300 needles at 300 East first Street okay and that was just a stash of needles underneath a bus bench from the needle exchange program so it's it's quality control um, the other issue is and, and they presented as a medical model in exchange for one dirty used needle for 20 clean needles so that, 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 that lends itself more to a needle distribution program and not an exchange. So in any event, that's all historical. But I did issue a, a formal letter. Um, our city manager also uh, issued a formal letter to the state on June 25th. Um, the cities of Orange, Anaheim, and Costa Mesa have also submitted letters opposing the program. Um, and I did uh, have a conversation with the Orange police chief and the Anaheim police chief. Um, and their um, essentially their question on point was, you know, how did this work out for you? Uh, and, and, and that was a very quick uh, point of conversation. It did not. And then I get into the examples. I, I think the city's position is, is, is robust. It's defensible. And it's all been submitted, and, and we're waiting to hear back. So that's where we are. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Villegas. Uh, thank you, Chief. I agree with you. It didn't work out at all. I'll support it. 
if they do it in Irvine. <laughs> they, and I'll support it, having it there and there only. Oh, that's that's it. No, and, and the reality is is that I think uh, the city has always take, tried, attempted to take a proactive approach, and we understood, we were sensitive to the uh, the health uh, impact. And, and there there is a health impact. However, it's kind of like when I sat down with the organization, when we made a decision to discontinue, I said to them, I said, you know, when you come into a city and, and they give you the opportunity to do this, it's your responsibility to do it, to, not, not just to a, a, a good, solid standard. I mean, I'm talking about a very, very high standard. You have to be able to do it correctly. You have to monitor it. You have to do all this. The organization was not, was not a, a full-time operation. It was a volunteer operation, which was, uh, a, a, quite frankly, a bit of a disaster. So I thank the city manager and the chief because together they came forward. And I, I'll never forget when uh, the city manager said, this is going to, you know, this is going to cause ruffles some feathers. And I said, no, but at the end of the day, we're talking about what you all came to, to talk about today is quality of life and, and where we balance that. And so we have to address those things. So um, I, I think it's, it's an absolute no right now. Uh, and it's going to continue to be that way until uh, we see a pilot somewhere else that works, and then we might consider it. But in the meantime, I just want to make the public aware that uh, by no means are we having a needle exchange here in the city. Um, and that brings us to committee member comments. Mr. Chair, I'm may, sorry, go ahead. I, may, I just wanted to also give uh, compliments to our staff. Uh, they did a really great job of putting together a package with all the uh, supporting documentation, if you will, why we were opposing this. We felt that we had to take a leadership position within the, the county of Orange because we were the only ones that have actually had a needle exchange program operating within our jurisdiction. And we wanted to be supportive because I know the, uh, the county of Orange has threatened some litigation if this permit is granted. So they're, they're going to need some kind of data, and we wanted to be supportive of that effort. So uh, staff did a great job at pulling it all together to get it on the record so if, there, uh, if there's a challenge by anybody, that could be the basis for it. So I just wanted to, to, uh, to thank the staff, and I also want to thank the council for their support. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, I know the gentleman mentioned uh, Irvine doesn't even have to uh, submit letters. Hmm. Our staff was telling me that the opiate crisis is actually bigger and, and a bigger problem in the southern part of the county. That is true. And yeah. so it makes me ask the question, why aren't we focusing on that for, uh, for this type of program? Uh, so we need to stand up for ourselves. I think uh, we're doing that with your leadership. Thank no, you. Thank you. And uh, count that committee member comments, uh, Council Member Villegas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chief Black, can you uh, give us a, a brief report on any of the fires or anything that happened over 4th of July? And I know it was really hot on Friday. It was terrible out there. Um, how are our firefighters doing? Um, they're doing really well. Um, and in terms of our activity on the 4th of July specifically, um, this year we had 41 fire responses. We had a total of 107 responses. Um, to give you a little bit of uh, comparison, we normally average around 40 total calls a day. Mm -hmm. So we doubled our total calls, and we normally have 70 to 80% of our calls are medical aid so you have 41 of our 107 total calls were fire calls so um, as uh, our police chief mentioned it's a busy day for us as well um, our peak activity was um, around 8 to 1 o'clock in the morning um, we had three injuries of significance I mean we have some minor stuff every time but we had a 16 year old and a 17 year old um, both males um, who had significant damage to their hands um, from illegal fireworks. And then we had a uh, young um, juvenile female who had a firework that landed um, on her head, uh, minor injury on that one. And we had uh, two significant structure fires. We had uh, one on uh, North Flower that it appears at this point from the investigation was a fireworks-related um, incident onto the balcony and then we had one over on um, 6th Street as well over by the wrecking yard over there um, that uh, appears to be fireworks related as well um, good news is uh, no no injuries to our firefighters um, you know we had a tense little situation there down on Lyon 
for a little while, but that all worked out as well. So um, I, I think that's about it. And we've got, um, for those of you who didn't know, we had some crews up north fighting the fires up in Northern California, and we have returned those. They're returning tonight. Um, so uh, we'll have most of our folks back um, by tomorrow morning. Great. Thank, Thank you. you for that report. And uh, again, congratulations to you on your promotion at OCFA. This is the last public safety meeting you'll be at here at the city. Is that correct? I'll be back by special request. When <laughs> <ready>. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Chief Black. And I want to thank all the staff for all their hard work and, um, and all the, um, the, the uh, senior management also for, for their leadership. And uh, definitely want to help the people out in the, in the creek with the fires. We're going to work on that. Um, Councilmember Tinajero was going to uh, speak a little bit about that. Um, and we definitely, I'm glad, um, you know, everyone came out here. We want everyone to know that we're going to do our best. I, my commitment, our commitment is to um, um, b make things better, period, and, and everything. And this right here, you know, when you have fires, it's just unacceptable. We need to definitely do that. We're going to have, we're going to order our staff to look into it. Um, and uh, see what we can do to improve the service out there and the safety of our residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Villegas. And um, for the residents that are here today, I don't like to give lip service. We like to take action. That's why I like Councilmember Villegas as well. Um, uh, what you said tonight resonates. It's on uh, top of our priority list. Um, and we're going to be talking with our chief and our city manager to assure that there's a game plan. And if there is a game plan, how can we even improve that game plan? In the meantime, uh, we want you to stay here. Um, I, I don't want to ask for patience because you've had a lot of patience. What I'm going to say is uh, we are going to start moving towards action to, to try to solve what's going on there. We do have a, a little bit of a, of a situation in that we do have some land use issues with that part. And then, and we also have an issue, you know, with enforcement with, because of the constraints of the land use. So I think our staff needs to come together to really uh, be creative on how we can work those two, because it's not just one over the other, it's both. And so let's make sure that we have something there. I'd like to hear from it. I know Councilman Villegas would like the same. Um, I saw uh, our board member from the Santa Ana Unified School District is here. She might be outside. Um, well, if she is outside, I can always talk to her. But I, I do want to say this, is that uh, we, we have an opportunity right now. I believe uh, the Santa Ana Unified School District uses Townsend Public Affairs as their lobbyist, and so do we. And so what's happening right now with all of the, the, the homeless issues and so forth that has come up, there is money. If you have a park that's adjacent to the Santa Ana River Trail or any river any uh, area where there's a river bed, um, we can apply for grants through the state of California as long as we have a partner with the school district. And they will give us a significant amount of money. When I mean a significant, we're talking about three hundred to $400,000 uh, to start with. Uh, depending on the size of your park. Centennial would get a big, big chunk of that. It would be in the millions that we could use to create fencing, to also uh, renovate some of those areas as well. So that's something that I would like to see if we could have a little report on that at the next meeting as well. Um, as we prepare to close, our next meeting is scheduled for September 11th. However, I, I want us all to keep it as a marker but we may be changing the date because that's uh, an important American historic date that there's a lot of events going on. We want to be able to honor the, the officers and, and, and fallen officers and firefighters during that time and flight attendants. Um, so there might be, uh, there might be a, uh, a change in the date, but that change, uh, we, if there is a change, we'll, we'll, we'll have it um, assigned within the next couple of weeks so that there's still ample time for the community to see that. And um, with that, um, I will adjourn this meeting, and our next meeting is scheduled tentatively for September 11, 2018. Thank you.